So when I say that the Lord is stretching me, many of you that have come here for some time know that I don't do serieses. I did one series on Acts, and I think it went three weeks. And so um, that, that's just, that, that just is not usually the way that the Holy Spirit speaks to me. But this time he showed me very specifically uh, to do this series on what is called, and go ahead and put the slide up, The Authentic Christian Life. Because one of the things that I observe, and I observe this when I meet other Christians, when I meet other pastors, and again, this, this again is not um, uh, judging or condemnation, it's just an observation. You know, if you ever use that, if somebody's like, well, I just feel like you're judging. No, 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 I'm not judging you. I'm making an observation. And so the observation that I'm making is that many times in the church, because of traditions, because of um, certain denominations, that, there, that sometimes denomination theology, even though no denomination would admit this, can trump biblical theology. Does this make sense? If any of you have ever grown up in a denominational church, there's sometimes you learn things and you're like, wait a second, that's not in the Bible. So, and and also there may be some things that have been taught for a long time that we really realize that like what we did was out of order. I'm going to show you today of the biblical order of things. How many of you know that if Jesus did it in a certain order, it's probably good that we do it in a certain order? right? We don't skip steps. And many times in the church, we're going to see from today's message is specifically going to be on repentance, but we skip steps. Sometimes before we come to Christ and get baptized, we skip repentance. If you really think about it, even though you've read it in the word, how many of you maybe perhaps grew up in churches, you don't have to put your hand up, but that taught you that you need to get saved, you need Jesus in your life so that you can be with him, so that you don't go to hell, but they never told you that you actually have to have a, have a mindset change before you even make that decision. Because many people are just like, well, you know, just run towards the altar, and, and you could just receive Jesus right now. That's why we actually don't do that here. Because, and I'm not saying that, that, that if you like in the moment want to do that, but, but, but for like for baptism Sunday, we have one person that is already going to be baptized that day. But if you want to get baptized, you have to meet with me. And I'm not saying you have to meet with me because I get to sign off on whether you get saved or not. But, but many times people think that this is just their get out of hell free card and they don't have to change their lives. And what I want to show you today is the concept of repentance. And I'm not talking about repentance in the idea of be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is a concept as well. But all throughout the Bible, from John the Baptist to, to Jesus, and then Peter in the book of Acts preached it, they always preached repentance first. And maybe some of you are quiet because you're like, well, I didn't know that. I thought we were supposed to come to Jesus and then Jesus cleans our life up. Because I've heard that before. People are like, well, you can't get your life clean and then come to Jesus because Jesus cleans your life. Well, that's true. He washes you white as snow. But that doesn't mean that you have to know before you are going to get water baptized and commit your life to Christ that it is a commitment. It's not like, I just want to not go to hell. But you know what? Jesus, get me out of hell, but just let me live my life. That is no form of Christianity. Yet I would guess that many of you know Christians that believe they're Christians because they said a sinner's prayer and they got water baptized at some point. But as far as Jesus leading them in their life before they make a decision, they pray about it or any of that, that is non-existent. And ultimately in Jesus is going to judge people's heart. But I would say as far as a fruit inspector, if you were arrested and cannot be convicted of being a Christian, I would say that you're not. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, no, but the Bible says just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and you will be saved. And I'm not teaching on that verse today, but you know that that is in Romans chapter 10 and in 9, 10, and 11, he's specifically talking to Jewish people. Yeah, I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. But that verse has been propped up so that we can go, well, all I'd have to do is confess and believe, and then I can live my life, and it's all good. And I'm not saying that that verse cannot mean that in certain applied texts. How many of you know about the story about the thief on the cross? Okay, he could have repentance and change his mind, but he didn't get water baptized. 
He could have had repentance and changed his mind, and he didn't get Holy Spirit baptized. He was hanging on a cross dying. So I'm not saying that there are not deathbed confessionals and that kind of stuff, but I'm saying that verse, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. People think that's all I have to do, and then I could just do whatever. And I'm not saying any of you lovely people believe that. I'm just saying that that many times is taught in churches. And the whole coming to Christ thing before repentance is out of order. And I'm going to show you through Scripture that it's out of order. Don't just be like, well, Pastor Josh said it's out of order. It's out of order. I'm going to show you that there is nowhere in the Bible that you come to Jesus before you repent. So you ready? All right. Okay, let's go to the first. Uh, first. So, so we should define re what repent means um, because, again, that's not usually a word that we use outside of church. So repent in the Greek means uh, metanoio. Um, and some of you may be like, well, I thought it was metanoia. That, that's actually the word repentance. This is just the word repent. So metanoio is a verb. So if I say repent, and, and you're saying, I am repenting of something, you're using it in the verb. If I talk about it as repentance, it's a noun. So this is a verb, metanoio, which means to change one's mind, purpose, and direction. So again, you are to change your mind, your purpose, and your direction before you ever get water baptized, before you ever receive Jesus as your Savior. So let's go on to the next slide. So I want to show you that Jesus himself and Peter preached repentance. Jesus says this in Mark 1, 15. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is talking about the time is fulfilled, talking about uh, how many of you know in your Bibles there are, um, and I, again, I know this is kind of a churchy word, but there are dispensations. There are periods of time with which God operated. Before Moses, he operated with people by faith, right? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him or credited to him as righteousness. So that was during that, that time period, and God made a covenant with Abraham, which means Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, Israel had 12 sons, and that's how uh, we have the Jewish nation today. Does that, ever, does that make sense? Okay, so before that, before Abraham, God dealt with people differently because sin was starting to come into the world. So for instance, Cain killed Abel. Under the law, that, that offense was punishable by death. But when Cain killed Abel, since he lived before the law, God put a mark on him. And, and again, the Bible isn't specific about what this means. But basically, everybody knew wherever he went that God's hand was on him and don't touch him. And then later, uh, generations later, there's a guy that ends up killing two people in self-defense. And he said, you know, if Cain basically was forgiven uh, because he actually committed murder, he killed his brother in cold blood, then he said, then, then I, if anybody kills me, will be avenged sevenfold. Because it says if anybody kills Cain, God would revenge on them. And, and so this guy comes to this conclusion going, well, I didn't kill in cold blood. I killed in self-defense. So if somebody touches me, then... I'll be avenged sevenfold, but the Bible doesn't say God said that. So human beings were coming into this idea, and then, of course, it gets so bad. Sin just pollutes everything. People's minds get warped. You know, you have fallen angels procreating with humans, producing half demon, half or half fallen angel, and half human. And then basically, you know, God starts over with Noah. But again, it's important to know your history because God dealt with people in different ways. And I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day is that many times we don't understand that we are in the dispensation or the time period of grace. And so many times we read the Old Testament and try to take Old Testament concepts, which was how God dealt with Israel under the law, and we try to take that and apply it in our regular situations. And in the name of Jesus, you can't do that. If you want to live under the law, good luck. Because if you try to live under the law, that means you've made the cross of no effect in your life. And then, 
so, so you have to understand that Jesus deals with us based on covenant. You know, you hear people say all the time, like, oh, you know, all the, the debauchery that's going on in Las Vegas and some of these other towns, you know, like in Chicago, you know, God's going to pour forth his wrath on that. Absolutely, he is not. He will in the last day, but his wrath is going over the whole planet. But you have to understand how God deals with this. He deals with us in grace, by grace through faith. So when Jesus, I mean, I know that was kind of a big tangent, but I'm, I'm trying to explain what Jesus means when he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So there is the period of the law. Jesus actually teaches under the law, but there's this transition going on when Jesus is here and it is the complete transition when he dies on the cross and is resurrected and ushers us into the time or dispensation of grace. Does this make sense? So, so when he says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, he's talking about this ushering in of the kingdom of God, this new dispensation of grace that's coming. So as he's preaching this concept, he says to what? Repent and believe the gospel. But many, again, people today are believing the gospel, but they didn't repent. They didn't change their mind about certain things. And how you know that is if there are believers that are still living the lifestyles of unbelievers. And I'm not talking about that you'll never sin again, but I'm talking about, and, 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 and we'll get to this at the end, about how repentance applies to each one of us. And we're going to get to that at the end. So Jesus preaches repent. And so if Jesus teaches us to repent and then believe, that's good enough for me. Peter, in Acts 2.38, this is after Jesus has gone back to heaven, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens, the tongues of fire on the 120 in the upper room, and then they move into the street, and then there's speaking in tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Um, and then after all of this happens, Peter gets up and preaches a message and says, you know, these people are not drunk. You think they're drunk because they're speaking in tongues, even though you can understand it in your own language. So I don't know why people thought that. That's weird. So he says... He gets up, preaches this message, and if you read it, it's actually kind of a convicting uh, message because he's like, you know, we're preaching Jesus. You know that one that you guys crucified. And so he preaches this message, and at the end of it, the, it says that the people in the crowd were cut to the heart, and they said, what must we do to be saved? And so here it comes of saying, many of us today Especially when you've come to Christ, you're like, what must I do to be saved? And people are like, and, and again, depending on the church you were brought up, you can go, well, just believe in your heart. Okay. Oh, just get water baptized. There's actually some churches out there that teach, unless you go under the water, you're not saved. Which I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there is nothing magical in that water. It is well water. It stinks when it comes out. It smells like rotten eggs in here for two days, which is why I have to fill the tub many days before the actual baptism. So I'm not saying that if you go under the water, you might have an experience, but it's spiritual. I know Carrie Underwood said there's something in the water, but she's wrong. There's nothing in that water. Okay, so again, the question from a crowd of people, tens of thousands of people, if not over a million, because this is at Pentecost. This is one of the big festival days. Peter says this is what you must do. The first thing he says is repent. And again, repent, every Jewish person knew what that meant. Why? Because many of them remember when John the Baptist was talking about it. So he says, repent, each and each of you be baptized. So it says, repent first, and then each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, because Jesus is the one who forgives sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I would not only argue that many people are not teaching repentance in church, and we will get to this as an entire teaching, but many people are not preaching the baptism with the Holy Spirit in church. Brothers and sisters, that is not optional. You know, I, I would just like my sins forgiven, and I just like, like, like to get dunked, but I don't want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because the tongues and the gifts and stuff, that, that's just crazy to me. I don't want that. It's not your choice. I mean, it is your choice, but you can't be a Christian and go, I don't want the baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
That's not optional. If it was optional, then Jesus would say it's optional. And again, how many of us want to be like Jesus? Did Jesus get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Right? His was, you know, a lot of you have stories about being baptized in the Spirit. Some are more dramatic than other. I don't know. I think Jesus had the best one. I mean, literally, the sky parted. There was a loud voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I will please. And people could visibly see something that was like a dove coming and descending on him. That's a pretty cool baptism with the Holy Spirit. So, again, I don't want to preach on that today because that's going to be an entire week we're going to talk about that. This week is just on repentance. So, Peter said, repent first, then you get water baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, again, people assume that going, oh, well, when you get water baptized, you just automatically get the Holy Spirit. And I know this church knows better because we just taught that God's good hand full of gifts is always extended towards us, but you have to receive it. It just doesn't come automatically. He doesn't throw gifts at you. He hands them to you, and you have to receive it by what? Faith. So if you don't receive the Holy Spirit by faith, you don't get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus emphasized repentance, and then even in the dispensation or time period of grace, Peter is also preaching repentance. So have I made a good biblical argument that repentance is the first thing? Okay. All right. So let's see what this looks like in context. Um, and, and basically, we can kind of expound upon this. So let's go to the first verse. So if you have your Bibles, this is also in uh, your notes in your app or on your U version, whatever version you prefer. This is with the Greek um, this is taken from Luke chapter 3. There's a similar passage in Matthew chapter 3 that talks about this as well, but I wanted to take it from Luke's gospel. So when it says John, this is not the apostle John. This is John the Baptist. It says, John, so, and, and, and just so you know, this is Jesus' cousin. John began speaking to the crowds who were coming to him, excuse me, were coming to be baptized by him, saying, you children born of venomous snakes. This really st stuck out to me this time when I read this. Could you imagine? It, it, says, it says the crowds were coming to be baptized by him. So could you imagine if we had an altar call? And I'm like, if you want to get baptized today, come on up. And then you start coming up, and I'm like, you children of venomous snakes. That might not inspire you to continue with the baptism. But this is exactly what John did. Now, I'm going to explain why he did it. But that's what he said. People are coming in droves. Again, I don't know if you've seen Bible movies and that kind of stuff. Maybe some of you have been to Jerusalem and, and seen the River Jordan. Like, there are crowds. There are thousands of people flocking to John the Baptist who eats locusts and wild honey. So, um, and it says that he wore camel's hair. I've smelled a camel before. You ever, any of you like had your kids ride a camel or something? That does not smell good. But could you imagine somebody wearing camel hair standing in, in water, probably up to his waist, for many, many hours? So you had to really want to be baptized by John, and like you're going over there almost not trying to like throw up in your mouth a little bit. Because that's what he says that he's worn. So I'm, I'm assuming what camel's hair really stunk. So, but, but they're coming to him in droves, and instead of going, yes, come to me, because like you're, we're going to get ready for Jesus and all of this kind of stuff, he doesn't do that. He calls them children born of venomous snakes. In your uh, Bibles, it probably says brood of vipers. I wanted to make sure that you understood what brood of vipers meant. And, and for my, my youngest daughter, who likes snakes, uh, I know that when I looked this up in Bible Hub, when I clicked on viper, um, this, is, this is not in the Bible. I'm talking about Bible Hub. I don't want you to think that your Bibles are inaccurate. But in Bible Hub, it says that a viper is a poisonous snake. And I'm like, that's not true. It's a venomous snake. Because my, my daughter would correct me on all that. Poisonous snake means if I touch the outside of the snake, then the poison comes through him. But venomous means when he bites you, he injects toxins. That's venomous. Now you know something about snakes. 
Okay, so they're coming to him, and he makes this statement. And then he, he, he keeps going. Who told you to escape the coming wrath? And, he's, and again, he's talking about the wrath of God. So he calls them offspring of venomous snakes. And then he tells them, basically, you know, who told you? Who told you to escape from this? And then he says, therefore. How many of you know that when in the Bible it says, therefore, it's talking about the previous statement? So therefore, because you're offspring of venomous snakes and you're trying to escape the wrath that is to come, therefore, produce fruits that, and your Bibles might say, in keeping with repentance or worthy of I actually don't like that translation. It's the word in the Greek, axios, which means perfectly balanced. So therefore, it says, therefore, produce fruits that are perfectly balanced with repentance, which is the word metanoia, which means mind changed after consideration. So so if you put all of that together, what John is saying as they're coming to him to be water baptized And it says that John was preaching a baptism of repentance. But he's saying, don't just come up here and go, hey, look, all of these people are going out to this crazy guy in the wilderness. Let's go check it out and see what's going on. And then they're going over there like, man, all these people like getting baptized. Like there's all, I mean, this is really some cool stuff. Let's, let's just go get baptized too. How many of you know that sometimes we can get caught up in the moment or caught up in an emotional moment, but then once the emotion settles, then everything else goes back to normal. Now, I'm not talking about that God cannot, in the moment, cause you to weep or to laugh or anything like that. I'm I'm not against that, but I'm saying many times us as human beings make decisions based on emotions, which is wrong. And that's what he's saying. Basically, th- th- this crowd is hyped up. Everybody's getting baptized. It's like, well, well my, my, my buddy Duke over there, he got baptized. I'm going to go get baptized too. So he's saying, wait. Do you understand if you're coming to get baptized that you need to produce fruit that perfectly balance with repentance? So what is that saying? Y- You having a mind change isn't enough. Your mind change then has to produce fruit. Now, you can repent of what you are doing and then come to Christ. And then there's what we would call a continual repentance, which the Bible talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's always a continual renewing of your mind. You're always learning. You're always growing. You may have messed up in one situation, but now the Lord is uh, helping you through that. And now you know how to handle the situation differently. But basically you've got people many times in the church coming to Christ. They get water baptized. They receive Jesus. And I'm, and I'm more thinking of like young people, but they go right back to school and they continue to bully people. And they go right back to school and they continue to swear with their friends. And they go right back to school and wear inappropriate things that cause their young brothers to stumble. Like yoga pants. I'm serious. And I'm, but I'm saying, that, so, so there's no repentance. You just wanted to, like, you know, I, I don't want to go to hell. There has to be repentance. And you have to make the decision in your mind of going, when I am going to get water baptized, when I'm coming to Christ, my life no longer matters to me in the sense of Josh doesn't get to do what Josh wants to do anymore. That, um, you know, I, if I'm in a situation where I'm not saying kind words to my wife, I may be a little bit verbally abusive, I'm not though, right, dear? Okay. Okay. I'm hypothetical. And then, and then if I have repentance and I get water baptized, that means that stops. Now there might not be times where I might not get angry in the moment and then it can, and and then it happens. And then I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new in my spirit. I need to understand that so that I stop doing that. And then I'm going to give you know, some other examples as we go along, but you have to understand, you have to apply repentance in your life. And and John says it like this. He says, how you act, or, you know, we would talk about fruit because Jesus would also say you will know them by their fruit. So it's saying if you truly have repentance in your mind, it will live out 
in your fruit. And if, and if you're not bearing fruit that Paul says, or excuse me, that John says, producing fruit that's perfectly balanced with mind change, then you are going to continually be children born of venom, venomous snakes. Because Jesus says it like this later. Because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. When he's trying to tell them, listen, you need to become my sheep. You need to become part of the kingdom. You need to do this. And they were like, well, you know, we have Abraham. And you know, all of these different excuses they were giving to him. Well, you know, prove it. Do some miracles and all this kind of stuff. He says to him, why? he says to the crowd, Jesus, why do you not understand my words? And then he says, because you cannot understand my words, you are children of your father, the devil. So Jesus says later, what I would almost think is even worse than being born of venomous snakes. But of course, we know that, that the serpent, because of the garden, is a picture of the devil. And when Jesus talks about you'll be able to tread on, on serpents and scorpions, he wasn't saying, Make, go find a place where there's a bunch of snakes and scorpions and just do this. He's talking about demonic things when he talks about that you will be able to tread on serpents and scorpions. He's talking about having authority over, over the demonic. So if Jesus says, because you cannot hear my words and because you will not have repentance and come to me, you are of your father the devil, John is saying the same thing. Do not come up here and get water baptized. Do not come up here. And of course, they weren't receiving Jesus as Lord at the time because they weren't revealing Jesus. But I'm talking about today. Do not come and get water baptized and receive Jesus unless you're willing to have a complete mind change of how you're living your life. And I thank you for that one amen, because I know that this isn't a popular message to preach, because people are like, no, 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 you just come to Jesus and then fix your life. I'm not talking about you have to be perfect and then come to Jesus. I'm saying you have to make the decision of your mind of going, this is not just something I'm going to go through and then go about my day. This is my life is going to change forever, and I'm making the decision in my brain so that when I go forward and get water baptized and receive Jesus, that I am then going to bear fruits that balance, axios, balance perfectly with repentance. Think about it this way. R remember the scales that kind of tip like this? And if you put a weight on one side without this, it just completely goes down, but you have to put an equal amount on the other side and they balance. That is what John is talking about, that your fruit has to match your repentance. Amen? All right, I think we really pounded that in there. Okay, let's go on. Okay. And he's, he's, he's in mid-sentence here. Do not start saying inside yourself. Now, remember, he's talking to Jews. Well, Abraham is my father. He says, I am telling you, this is John, that God, in his power, can make children of Abraham from rocks. What was he saying? The Jews believed, listen, I'm chosen. God loves me. All of this simply because I am of the lineage of of Abraham. And so that's why John heads them off at the pass. Do not start saying inside of yourself, you know, like if there's people kind of watching and they're like, I don't need to get baptized for repentance. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm of the lineage of Abraham. And so he even calls it out. You might say that in this moment, John has what we would call a word of knowledge. He knew what they, some of them were thinking. So he says, do not begin to say with yourself, well, Abraham is my father. I'm telling you, God in his power can make children of Abraham out of rocks. So basically, he's saying, if that's what you're going to, if, if that's going to be your thing, God can just make new children, and he can make them out of rocks. Listen, right now, again, you have to remember, this is the message John is giving why people are trying to come and get baptized. If anything, this looks, if you didn't understand it, that John is trying to dissuade them to getting baptized. But may I say this to you, if you're thinking about getting baptized, I'm trying to dissuade you as well if you're not willing to make the commitment. If you're not willing to make the commitment, do not bother because repentance comes first. So he says, you know, uh, offspring of, of snakes, venomous snakes. He says, don't tell me that Abraham's your father. God can make new children. And then he says, listen, right now the act is in position and aimed at the root of the tree. And he's talking about them being trees. Therefore, every tree not producing beautiful fruit is cut out 
by the root and thrown into the fire. You know, people used to talk about Jonathan Edwards would, would, would preach fiery messages like basically you need Jesus because you're dangling over hell um, by, a, by a thread and that thread is on fire. People would come in droves. But, you know, people call that hell, fire, and damnation preaching. Uh, that sounds to me what John's preaching. And so he's saying, listen, if you're not going to bear fruit that is in balance with repentance, not only don't bother coming up here, but the ax, it's, it's in position to cut you out by the root and you will burn. Now, again, people are like, well, but this is, this, is, this is some pretty harsh stuff, and this was before Jesus. You know that Jesus says in John 15, if you want to go there with me real quick, because I don't have this one on the screen. Jesus himself says something very similar. So this is John 15, 1 through 6. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Here it is. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, again, fruit with, consistent with repentance, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Here it is. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, Jesus, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, dries up, and they gather the dried up branches and cast them into the fire to be burned. So I know this is specifically talking about them as trees being uprooted. Later, again, remember Jesus is in this period of where we're, we're moving away from the law and moving into the new dispensation of grace. But Jesus is saying, listen, when you find out that I am the Savior, I am the Messiah, you have to continually, as you live on this planet, abide in me. You cannot bear fruit on your own. In fact, if you're not bearing fruit, that means you're not abiding in me because fruit is the evidence of abiding in the vine. That's what he says. And, and if not, eventually you will be broken off, you will dry up, and then you'll be thrown into the fire. What is he talking about? Hell. Because again, we just have this idea of once in grace, always in grace. And if you abide in grace, then fine. But you can't come up and go, well, you know, I made a decision when I was 10 years old to do this. And then you lived your rest of your life with no evidence, no fruit. You never went to church. You never encouraged your brothers and sisters. You never read the word. Again, I am not the final judge. But, I, but I'm telling you what the Bible says, that's some harsh language. Broken off, dried up, thrown into the fire. John the Baptist said it, and Jesus reiterated it in John 15. And in John 15, if you want to understand the timeline, that is at the end of his ministry. It's literally the night that he is betrayed and taken is when he says those words. It's after the Last Supper. So it's not like, well, Jesus said that early on in his ministry. No, he's imparting this deep teaching to them and letting them know before he's getting ready to go away and be arrested. Okay, next verse. Okay, so after John has just berated the crowd for coming to get water baptized or giving them a very cautious warning of, do you understand what you're entering into is probably a better way to say it. He says the crowds respond with this question, what should we do? This is very important because I need to remind myself as pastor, I need to give you something each week to apply in your life. My wife says this to me all the time. Yeah, I heard everything you said, and yep, super deep and all of that, but I, how do I apply that to my life? I heard what you said, but, I, but how am I supposed to apply it? You need to give me some application. And so that's the same thing they're saying. They're like, wow, I'm going to be cut out from the root. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an offspring of venomous snakes. Um, it, the fact that I claim that I'm Abraham's uh, son doesn't really mean much. So they're saying, okay, so John, give us the answer, man. I don't want to go to hell. So it, they said, what should we do? John answered them by saying, if you have two shirts, share with a person who doesn't have one. Now, that may be a simple concept to us, but the, J Jews, unless you were like 
you know, one of the rich people that when Jesus meets the rich young ruler and that kind of stuff, the vast majority of, of the Jewish population was poor. That's what, um, because they were under Roman rule and that kind of stuff, and they had to pay heavy taxes and all of that kind of stuff. You, you know, it kind of feels like America today. Paying lots of big taxes to a dictator that um, just takes our money and funds abortion clinics and transgender surgeries and wars and all of this other kind of stuff. I'm not getting into politics. I'm just, you know, going, maybe you could empathize a little bit with this group. So he says, if you have two shirts, share with the person who doesn't have one. Makes sense. But he says, that's what repentance looks like. In the same way, if you have food and someone doesn't, share it with them. It says, tax collectors also came to John to be baptized and asked the same question. So again, they're coming to John to be baptized, and they're not saying, I want to get ba- I'm going to get baptized, he dunked him, and then go, now what must I do? They want to know what they must do first, because now they understand that repentance comes first. Because they're like, if I'm going to change my life and get baptized for repentance, I need to know what that looks like, so that when I leave the Jordan River, I need to know what my life change looks like. And so tax collectors came to John and to be baptized and asked the same question. Next verse. John answered saying, collect only what you are ordered to collect. Why is this important? Because tax collectors back then, if Caesar said, go to each house and collect 50 bucks, the Jews didn't know that. So your Jewish brother would come to your house and go, Texas are $75. And you'd give him $75, and he'd give 50 to Caesar and put the other 25 in his pocket. That's what tax collectors did because nobody knew what the taxes were, only the tax collectors. So he says, collect only what you're ordered to collect. If Caesar says it's 50 bucks, don't collect 75. Collect 50 and give it all to him. Stop lying in your pockets. And it says, soldiers, likewise, asked what they should do. Now, these are not Roman soldiers. These are Jewish soldiers. Soldiers, likewise, asked what they should do. John replied. Now, you could tell I took the Greek and put it in modern language. No more shakedowns. Why? What were they doing? They are basically stopping people and then going, hey, listen, uh, if you don't want to go to jail because I know what you did yesterday, cough up some money. So, so John is calling them out on this. No more shakedowns. Stop falsely accusing people of crimes. Wouldn't that really be really great as a soldier? If you had a beef with someone, just, could, um, um, just say that they committed a crime, and then you could just arrest them and put them in there because the soldiers had that kind of power. It was not lawyers and, you know, all of these things, and they had big trials and all of that kind of stuff because it was ultimately decided by the Sanhedrin. So if a soldier's like, yeah, I saw that person stealing the other day, they're like, well, it's your word against him, and you're a soldier, so that's what it is. So he tells them, no more shakedowns. Stop falsely accusing people of crimes. Here's one that you can all receive with joy in your hearts. Be satisfied with your paycheck. John said it under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because all of this, if you think about it, two shirts, give somebody who doesn't have one. You have lots of food, give to somebody who doesn't. Uh, Tax collectors, stop lining your pockets. Soldiers, stop shaking down people for money. So if you actually put all of those together, what's the main thing that he's dealing with? Greed, money, possessions or things that buy those things. Next verse. Oh, that was the end of it. Okay, so, so I say all of that to say, and again, those of you who are, have already been water baptized, have already believed on, on Jesus, um, the, repentance is now more about be transformed by the continual renewing of your mind because if, if we don't incorporate that, then you who have already had repentance, have already been water baptized, have already received Jesus, then you're like, this doesn't really apply to me because I already did all of that. We have to have continual repentance in the form of being, uh, in, it, we have to have continual repentance in the idea of Romans 12:2 which is do not be conformed to this world, but be continually transformed by the renewing of your mind. So 
in the same way, people in the crowd said, what, what, what should I do? And, and, and did you notice that repentance looked differently for different people? It looked differently for the tax collector. It looked differently for the soldier. It looked differently for just the average citizen there. And so what does repentance look like for you? Now, you need to examine your own lives. But I mean, again, if you're sitting in here and you're a child uh, under the age of 18, do you know what repentance looks like for you? Stop talking back to your parents. When they tell you to do something, do it without grumbling or complaining. And all the parents said, children, you need to listen, okay? Because if you can't just go, oh, you know, Pastor Josh was just joking. I'm not joking. The Bible says, okay, so here's a great thing, kids. Be grateful that you are in the time, season, and uh, dispensation of grace. Because in the Old Testament, if you did not honor your mother and father and you were a continual problem, they literally, the town, took you outside and hit you with rocks until you died. So, so that's when you could go, praise Jesus that I am under grace and not under the law. They, they did that back then. But do you know why? Because children who are continually disobedient most likely had a demonic thing going on, and back then they couldn't be delivered from demons. So the only way to do that, to continue that they didn't, you know, corrupt other people, or if they had multiple demons in them, pass them on to their siblings, they had to kill them. And I know people are like, well, that's not a loving God. It, it, it's not about it's not a loving God. That was the covenant that he made with the people. They wanted that. They said, if I do good, I want to be blessed, and if I do bad, God, you can punish me. So children, yes, if, if you were a continual Issue, if there was a continual issue of disobedience, they eventually just killed you. So, how many of you know that Jesus did everything his parents told him to do? Children, do you want to be like Jesus? Honor your father and your mother. Now, that's what it looks like. For children. Now, I would not give the same advice to adults, but, you know, if you are someone who works for, your, for a boss that you don't like, you know what repentance looks like? He may not be deserving of respect, but respect the title and the position. That's what repentance looks like. Be content with your paycheck. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't go back to school or learn a new trade or something to advance in your pay, but don't grumble about what you get. I will engage in this too. We need to stop grumbling about high gas prices and high taxes. Is that, is that fun to have high taxes and high gas prices? No. But do you know that grumbling and complaining is listed as a sin? And again, praise God that we are under the dispensation of grace because back then when you grumbled against somebody, there was literally time people grumbled against Moses and the ground opened up and swallowed everybody who was grumbling. They died. Stop grumbling, stop complaining, and I, I got to do this stuff too. Because again, J Jesus lived in a time period where he had to rely every day on food from, from people from, and from his father. He didn't walk around and go, oh man, Caesar raised the gas tax again. Hey, 12 disciples, come here. Let's, let's sit around and just complain about Caesar. I don't think he did that. So, again, what does repentance look like for you? So, you know, I could sit here and keep continuing the list. I could say if you're married, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's, you, need to, you just need to do that. that. That is a command in the Bible. And then wives, you need to honor and respect your husband as the spiritual leader of the household. But again, I could list everything in here about what repentance looks like. But instead, why don't you guys do your homework and examine each and area of your life and ask this question, is that what Jesus would do? You know, the bracelets, what would Jesus do? It's a really simple concept, but we don't do it. Going, and, and how many times do we do something and then we're like, yeah, 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 I know Jesus wouldn't do that, but... Everything that comes after that is a lie from the devil and your excuse to try to get out of something.
Here's one to, to pick on. And then I might end with this. How many of you are piggybacking Netflix or Prime or something off somebody else who's paying it and you're getting for free? You know what that's called? Theft. I don't know who that is in here, but you're stealing and it's a sin. Didn't get a lot of amens on that one, but it's the truth. You came here for truth, amen? So you need to seriously think about some of these things. And that's not condemnation. There's things that as I was doing this, I'm going through in my life and I will continue to go through in my life. I'm putting myself under the microscope too. But I'm saying, do you want to live the authentic Christian life or not? So again, examine your life and just ask the simple question, in each and every area, what would Jesus do? Amen.